Canada's debanking people. What does debanking mean? It means shutting down people's bank accounts. Why not heard of that? Because Canada's also got online streaming laws that mean you can't be told the news. Oh, well, it's just Canada piloting dystopia. It's happening in other countries as well, like the UK. Oh, so is hell around the corner? Well, no, it's actually here. We've got to do something. <laughs> Hello there, you Awakening Wonders, wherever you may be. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for elevating your consciousness beyond the fear. Thanks for remaining discerning. Thanks for having values and principles and staying awake and believing in a better future. Maybe we can get beyond these institutions, wars, lies, escalate in tension and despair. Maybe we can do it together. Can we? Can we? I believe we can. And you know our hope and optimism is one of the raw resources of change that at least we can provide. I pray unto you, Lord. Follow us. Us. Download the app on Rumble, then you'll know if you turn on the notification bell. Unlike on some sites, Rumble will tell you. We stream every day at 12 Eastern times. So you can see our full shows there. You'll love them. So, Canada. like It's not like Canada was a utopia, an Eden, a vision of a better world. Even if they do have politicians called things like Justin Trudeau or Christia Freeland. The sarcastically named Canadian politicians. What's your name? Truth. Freedom. What's your policy? We're in charge. It's a strange and crazy place. I never looked at Canada as a sort of an outlier when it comes to like a perfect civilization. Although I will say, as an English person, you always think America's going a bit too far with the colonizing the world and the resource wars and all that kind of stuff. I'm talking about, you know, back in Iraq days. And I always think that Canada and Australia, well, they're not as bad as we are, trenched in tradition and the colonialism and all the blood on the hands of that stuff. But also they're not doing the new commercial version of colonialism that America's doing. Maybe Australia and Canada are some sort of slightly more neutered version of an anglophonic future. But now both those countries are essentially pilot schemes for dystopia, whether it's internment camps in Australia during the lockdown or Canada, it's new online censorship bill, basically a censorship bill. We've got one of those here, of course, as well. But now they're like literally debanking people. I don't like keep saying debanking because it sounds too much like debunking people. I debunk you, sir. How dare you? This maple syrup's perfect. It's not that. It's like they're shutting down people's bank accounts, usually because they don't agree with their views, like with the famous trucker con Boys, they started messing with people's money. When they start messing with your money, messing with your free speech, that's not good, is it? Let's get into it. A bank or other financial service provider will be able to immediately freeze or suspend an account without a court order. Okay, well that's terrifying. Don't just say that as if it's all right while Justin Trudeau stands there covering his mouth and genitals simultaneously, as if that prevents us from seeing what's truly happening here. Canada is meant to be a country that is a celebration of liberalism. What does liberalism mean these days? Let us know in the chat. Now, if you follow Jordan Peterson, you'll know that there are all sorts of extraordinary stuff with his license as a clinician that doesn't seem right. And what we can't fall into, and I beg you not to, I know a lot of you will love Jordan Peterson, and certainly I love Jordan Peterson, but a lot of you will go, oh, Jordan Peterson, no, isn't he, like, sexist or whatever? Or Nigel Farage, who we'll be talking about later. I've had, like, actual arguments on TV with Nigel Farage and spats because I don't agree with him on a bunch of stuff. But I tell you what I don't think, that you should shut down Nigel Farage's bank account because you don't agree with him. I don't think that. I think Nigel Farage should be allowed to express himself freely in a democracy. And if in a democracy, a referendum don't go your way, hey, baby, democracy that you said you love. So when you start shutting down people bank accounts, shutting down people's free speech, and when the rest of us go, oh, I don't mind really because I don't agree with that person, what we are is sort of compliant with emergent forms of fascism. The Canadian government is cracking down on financial supporters of the illegal blockade. So if you are one of the Canadians who donated, should you expect your bank accounts to be frozen today? Well, no, because that's terrifying. Also, they just glibly refer to it as an illegal convoy. What do you mean illegal convoy? Just for a minute, step back. If you don't agree with something that's happening in your country, your country that you live in, should you be able to protest without knowing what the subject is? What's it about? Is it something that I agree with? Uh, no. What well, you've got that? Have some principles. All right, then. Yes, you should be able to protest. Right. So why is this protest illegal? Because we don't agree with it. An emailed comment from the Canadian Bankers Association says the required measures will be diligently implemented by financial service providers, but they don't expect them to impact the vast majority of customers. They also did not define what diligently implement 
augmented means. <laughs> this means they're going to try their hardest to shut down the bank accounts of people they don't agree with. And it won't impact the vast majority of customers. I should hope not. I mean, if the vast majority of your customers are going to have their bank accounts frozen, I don't see things going very well at the bank. Well, it's quite good because we're keeping all their money. Canada's Minister of Finance, Christian Freeland, also announced that that order covers both personal and corporate accounts. But the Canadian Bankers Association said that we'll just have to wait and see how that plays out. <laughs> Probably be all right. Now, you might have noticed that this is a news report from a little while ago. The news that we're going to tell you is up to the second. But there is no mainstream media news or indeed online news on this because Canada have introduced an online safety bill that allows them to censor this type of information. And we're introducing these kind of bills all around the world. And you might have noticed that independent media voices are being vehemently attacked and shut down everywhere. Have you noticed that? Because I have. So look at what's going on. Hello. After three ministers, five years and dozens of amendments, the Liberal government's controversial online streaming act has finally become law. And there are some big changes coming for streamers. There certainly are. Everything you do is subject to new scrutiny and censorship and fines. You have seen that X were threatened with a fine just the other day. We'll be talking about that elsewhere. The law will require platforms to promote Canadian content. Good. Require streaming services like Netflix to pay to support Canadian me media content like music and TV shows. Aww. And it will give the CRTC broad powers over digital media companies, including the ability to impose financial penalties for violations of the act. Hmm, that doesn't sound as good, especially if you can't pay those penalties because your bank account's been shut down. Do you know what I mean? When you get the government sort of calling up social media companies and saying, are you gonna demonetize that person? This is not liberalism. Liberalism is not authoritarian. Are you noticing how words are changing their meaning? That is also not good. Free speech is an important value. Yes, but people are so hateful. What about the misanthropy? at the core of that. If you allow people to speak freely, they will say hateful things. Yeah, well, sometimes people aren't perfect, but I'd rather endure a little of that than the alternative, which is granting authority to institutions that we know are corrupt already and don't trust. So you've not heard about the debanking, firstly, because it's a stupid word, and secondly, because it's a ludicrous policy. If you're British, you'll have heard about the Nigel Farage story. If you're Canadian, you might not have heard of the debanking that's going on in your country because it, people aren't reporting on it because there's a censorship law in place that prevents the truth from being accurately conveyed. I'm not making this up. It's actually happening. You can look it up for yourself, but actually we'll do it for you and save you a bit of time. A sweeping debanking wave has swept across Canada, affecting over 800 citizens in its tide since 2018, a number which includes hundreds who rallied behind the banner of the Freedom Convoy, obviously. Data unearthed through an access to information request by Black Locks, not to be confused with Black Rocks, please don't confuse them with Black Rocks, Porter unveiled a disturbing pattern where 837 individuals found the doors of their banks slammed shut on them over a span of five years. The Financial Consumer Agency of Canada was brought into the loop through grievances lodged with regulatory bodies shedding light on financial strangulation that bypassed cases of validated terrorism and money laundering. Right, so terrorism and money laundering that's a legitimate reason, I guess, to debank someone. Now, as has often been pointed out, in many of the areas where censorship regulation is introduced or new forms of regulation are introduced, we already have laws for that. Violence is already illegal. Terrorism is already illegal. Money laundering is already illegal. The new laws that you're legitimizing through the use of that language are actually redundant because that stuff's already legislated against. And hold on, there's a whole raft of new powers that are going to affect everybody. In a deeper dive into the numbers, it's revealed that the financial shackles tightened around 267 bank accounts and 170 Bitcoin wallets belonging to Freedom Convoy supporters ensnaring an estimated $7.8 million. That probably means they won't be able to protest, so you won't be able to argue with the government. So the government is a liberal government that believes in freedom and helping people. No, no, that doesn't sound right, does it? Tyrannical. Yes, that's what it is. The government government may not be on your team. The legacy media may not be on your team. But I'll tell you on our team and therefore yours. Sticker Mule. We've teamed up with Sticker Mule once more to create this limited edition sticker pack. You are going to love this. There are Wait a second, it's quite difficult to get in, but you know, got to keep these stickers safe. There are six stunning designs that are only available in this pack. Oh, isn't it exciting? They're all made with Sticker Mule's magic touch. Sticker Mule has 10,000 of these packs. That's right, 10,000 ready to deliver to your address absolutely free. You can have it now, like me. I've got this one. You can have one. Just go to stickermule.com forward slash Russell and fill out the form. 
warm. It's really worth it. You look like this one, part of my clothes now. Put it on your laptop, put it on your phone, put it wherever you want to. It's your life, it's completely free. 10,000 packs. Look at me contemplating life, just trying my best. Fantastic, good old sticker mule. Sticker mule, we loves ya. Okay, let's get back to this story about the Canadian government. Because I, I tell you what, you can't trust, do you know who should run Canada? Stick a mule. Come on, let's get into this. This exercise in financial censorship spun a web of scrutiny during a hearing on March the 7th, 2022, when Angelina Mason, representing the Bankers Association, testified. Mason outlined that while the Royal Canadian Mounted Police supplied a list of names, banks were also mandated by separate orders to exercise their judgment in identifying account holders for debanking. So they sort of asked, right, well, the police can have a little look, but they're busy, you know, they're mounted after all. They've got to tend to the horse, I suppose, and... That hat can't be easy to look after. So would you, the bank yourself, just have a look around in people's accounts, see if there's any familiar names, see if there's anything that you don't agree with going on. We can't empower banks to do that. That's not what a bank is. How can banks make moral decisions about their customers when they make their money through investing in all sorts of nefarious activity, weapons manufacturers, energy? Have you ever looked into how banks are making their money, what their moral position is? Do you remember what happened in 2008? Do you remember how that banking crisis played out? And you know who supported them in that? The government. So the government and banks being arbiters of morality, like the same way as the media. We're the media, and here is our moral. You're letting the actual scum of the earth determine right from wrong. What do you think that's going to lead to? We have to work fast. We have to work smart. We have to recognise, I recognise now, this is not a game anymore. This is actually happening. A few years ago, maybe you'd see someone like Alex Jones or something, you think, oh, come on, he's a sort of an hysterical preacher. And perhaps archetypally, there is some of that in a character like Alex Jones, who, let me say plainly, I don't agree with everything he says, the same way as I don't agree with everything Nigel Farage says. But I do agree with people's right to speak. I do agree with people's right to disagree with me. I do agree with principles of justice and legislation and order and democracy, ideas around which the argument is supposed to have been one. And the people and groups and parties that claim to most espouse and represent those values, guess what they're doing? They're at odds with those values. They're limiting those values. They're walking back those values and replacing them with authoritarianism. Just going, but look at our hair and listen to us saying that we care about this group or that group. They don't care about anything. They care about power. And even if they do care about those things, they're not legislating in alignment with the principles they're discussing. They're legislating in an authoritarian manner. The outrage at the Nigel Farage Coots Nat West debanking scandal in the United Kingdom Kingdom does not align with the complete disinterest in Canadian Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's debanking of an entire political caste. <laughs> in England, we do one person. In Canada, we're going to do an entire political caste. Hmm, nice one, Canada. Banking, it has been argued in the halls of Parliament, in the pages of major publications, is a human right in the modern world. Debanking, it follows, should be seen as an abuse of those fundamental rights. Unfortunately, it is clear UK parliamentarians only cared about the Farage debanking scandal because they could see themselves suffering the same fate when they're voted out of office, which is likely to be soon. This goes a long way to explaining why those same MPs who now make grand speeches about the human rights of banking said nothing and did nothing during the COVID years when their fellow Commonwealth nation Canada debanked citizens as punishment for protesting against the government. Giving police excessive powers to attack the finances of those attending peaceful protests shocked many, and yet the silence from leaderships around the world fell heavy on the air. Only the pages of the truly independent press were screeching. Only independent media can report on stories like this for now. That's being impeded by censorship laws around the world. The silence from the political class is understandable. It happened during a time when every Western government was engaged in the abuse of human rights and civil rights through various emergency powers and health orders. It was being normalised. We're now seeing, as many people said we would, post-COVID authoritarianism being normalised. The use of technology to extract people from mainstream culture normalised. If people don't get vaccines, they just shouldn't be allowed out. That's what it should be. If someone without a vaccine goes to a hospital, they should be refused treatment, right? Start to normalise that stuff. Now look what's happening. Well, if someone, you know, protests about something, you should shut their bank account down. What? When did all this... That's... Haven't we had that argument already, like, in medieval times? And didn't we agree that what we were going to do was people are allowed to have different views from one another? Like, wh where are all those values gone? Where have they gone? What's happening? None of our leaders broke ranks, observing the don't throw stones in a glass house ideology. The press are the ones who should have been pelted in rocks at these glass houses, but they kept quiet too, because they too had threatened their staff with mandates or taken vast sums of money from Big Pharma. If citizens tried to speak on social media, 
they were raised from platforms that were making a killing in pharmaceutical ad revenue. What a mess. The Russia-Ukraine conflict provided a well-timed distraction for Trudeau to wind back his emergency declaration and then not talk about it for months. While Trudeau scolded Russia for her authoritarian behaviour, his dictatorial leanings had already eroded Canada's democracy. To this, Trudeau blamed social media for spreading misinformation and disinformation which turned the people against the values and principles of democracies. Would those principles include the right to a peaceful protest, Trudeau? Or banking? So how can something as radical as shutting down people's bank accounts and empowering banks to shut down people's bank accounts, banks happen without being reported on? Because there's already censorship laws in place in Canada and it's happening in the UK and it's happening in your country. Do you know how I know that? Because it's happening everywhere. For months, representatives of Prime Minister Justin Trudeau's government insisted that their plans to regulate big tech social media platforms wouldn't impact independent news outlets or podcasters. Oh, what? And those promises were lies. But it turns out that the government is in fact going to regulate content providers, not just big tech social media platforms. So they've got two ways. They can directly control the content of the creators, but also they can threaten the social media platforms themselves with fines. So they're basically introducing laws to allow them to control the information on big tech platforms. That's happened already, actually. While the government is preparing to regulate independent content providers, whether news or podcasts, it's preparing to subsidise more news media content. I wonder what type of news media content will get subsidised. I wonder if it'll be like favourable news. I wonder if it'll be in news channels that don't go, hey, they're debanking your fellow Canadians because they disagree with the government. And that's not good, is it? Because we already know that democracy is ineffectual for two reasons. Both of the two parties that you can vote for are too similar to make a meaningful impact on the lives of ordinary people. Also, they are funded by the same interests. And there are sets of global bodies that dictate, as you have seen, in the last few years, their policies, whether that's on health, medical, or censorship matters. And now, independent media organisations that point that stuff out are being shut down. What don't you have? You don't have democracy. You have a kind of spectacle. The federal government already gives $1.4 billion in direct support to the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation compared to the $650 million it receives from commercial revenue. So it's not fair competition. That's state media. That's where you get propaganda from, is state media. Elon Musk recently said that many mainstream media providers were essentially state propagandist utilities. Now, in the case of this Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, what you have is state funding and commercial funding. So whose interests do you think they're representative of? The state, who provide funding, commercial partners, who provide funding, or you, Canadian people, who can have your bank accounts shut down if you don't do exactly what you're told. The Liberals are using two bills and a series of regulations to crack down on free speech online. C-11, the Online News Act, and C-18, the Online Streaming Act. While these bills worked their way through the legislative process, the Liberals repeatedly lied and said they were about targeting big tech and protecting and promoting Canadian culture. In fact, they were part of a deliberate effort to censor ordinary Canadians. They're not going to come out and say, we're going to censor ordinary Canadians. They say, oh, we've got big tech's got too much power, we have to shut them down. Meanwhile, what they have with big tech are partnerships. Partnerships, in the case of like the United States, you know that they have military contracts, all manner of tech and data contracts with companies like Microsoft, and Facebook. And now what they are doing is legislating new partnerships to control information and censor dissent. It's happening in Canada, particularly plainly observably now. This means it will be harder to express yourself online and digital first outlets will be disproportionately negatively impacted. Traditional outlets will be economically reliant on the feds and their lobby groups are already mobilising to push the federal government for more support. So much for independent journalism. Even I was a relative latecomer to YouTube, been on there for like 10 years or whatever it is. And I noticed, and you will have noticed, that at the beginning, prominent independent YouTube voices were given quite large S. It was like an ecosystem guided by the algorithm in which there was a kind of, I don't know, Darwinism, a kind of ecology that found its own way. But then there were some decisions made to promote what you might call legacy media within it. And now that's just blatantly happened, hasn't it? Now those sites are in lockstep with the government and legacy media. There's a war happening. There's a war happening for your attention, for your beliefs, for your faith, for your ideology. What they want from you is obedience, compliance, induced by fear. That's a very broad statement. I believe it to be true. What we want is to keep alive the possibility of change, of empowering individuals and communities outside of these establishment institutions. That's only going to happen, the good news 
news is it can happen, but it's only going to happen with individual responsibility. The famous comment, the thing that I always say in the chat, but what can I do individually? Resist. Awaken. Now, the government says it's doing this to protect and promote Canadian culture, ensure legacy news outlets operate for a healthy democracy, and ensure marginalised voices are heard. In reality, Trudeau and the Liberal Party are doing this so they can spread disinformation and quash dissent. Okay, we're going to have to leave that on this platform, but I'm telling you, it is so vital that you join us. Your government, your media, your bank, these are not moral institutions and they are not your friends. You need to participate in this movement. To watch the rest of this video, click the link in the description. It's over there. Download the app so you get the notifications. Remember, we stream every day and if you can, if it's within your means, press the red button, become an awakened wonder so that we can grow this movement together. Keep your hope and keep your faith. Stay free, click the link and if you can, stay free.